Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Good Books Radio. We have a great book for you today, but before I get to it, I want to thank our underwriter, audiobooks.com. We're going to be talking with uh, Catherine Ramsland, who is uh, an international expert on serial killers, and uh, she has quite a resume, as I like to say, in the in the dark world, <laughs> because she has written about serial killers, about mass murderers, uh, about sexual predators. Uh, she has been on numerous TV programs, coast to coast, uh, AM radio, for example, uh, not TV, but radio, but then lots of TV, Fox News, uh, CNN, all the ones, all the major cable networks, etc. cetera, uh, 2020, you name it, she's been on it as a requested expert. So we're talking to her about her new book about uh, essentially the biography of Dennis Rader, the BTK, uh, excuse me, BTK killer. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ramslin, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Before we get into uh, Raider, I want to throw this at you. Uh, if I were to, I just want to tell you my conception of uh, the serial killer profile. Now, I happen to know that this is a bit old, and it's at least partially wrong, but I'm going to describe it to you, the profile of a serial killer, and you tell me how I'm wrong, okay? Okay. Okay, the serial killer is a white male in his 30s. He lives with mama. He is a loner. Uh, when he was a, a kid, he killed little animals, and this was his entry into the world of serial killing. So where is that wrong? Um, every step. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old stereotype from uh, the early days when they had very little uh, documentation and very um, limited research capabilities, but it persisted because it was nice to have a formula. There is, in fact, no profile of a serial killer because there, it's a quite a diverse group. We, we really have you know, well over 1,000 documented that we know of, like more like 1,600, 1,700 around the world. And they are around the world. They're from a lot of different races. So um, if you're in South Africa, you're going to find a different type of serial killer than here or in Japan. It's going to be different than here. They just arrested one in India and uh, just arrested one in China. Um, there are male and female serial killers, and they can have families. Um, some certainly have lived with their mothers, but some don't and and have seem to pass as normal um, or live on their own or they have children. Um, many do torture animals, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. So you can't say that that's part of the formula. Um, Raider himself actually hanged barn cats, but he loved his dog. Oh. So <laughs> that's a little different. He killed chickens only because it was part of his job in the family mm -hmm. to do it. So that wasn't something he was was doing as a predator of any kind and he wasn't really cruel to people to little other little kids or anything mm -hmm. he doesn't have there's there's something called the mcdonald triad which is the fire setting bedwetting animal cruelty there's actually no research support for that so he doesn't have any of those either <laughs> well, do, you, do you think that this old profile helped other serial killers escape detection Absolutely, <laughs> because first of all, it really doesn't help investigators find anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but also, they and I do know of a case where they had decided that the, a serial killer could only be white, and what they had in their midst, this is in Louisiana, they had a black serial killer who was entering white homes in white neighborhoods. He was noticed, he was reported. But the police had in their mind the stereotype, and they thought, there's no way that's a serial killer, and they were wrong. Uh, well, the one I think of is uh, the Washington, D.C. sniper, where yes. everything they were looking for was wrong. Yeah. Well, but, you know, it wasn't the FBI that gave them that profile. It was, was people shooting from the hip. Mm -hmm. and news people were grabbing the, them, and they didn't have any really real credentials. The FBI was telling them, we don't have enough behavior to give you a profile. Mm -hmm. And the one that actually was given, which has surfaced, was pretty accurate. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Well, I, I thought the thing that was throwing them off was the, you know, the the shooter, uh, and they just assumed that it had to be coming from a van, and then they connected. Well, that's that because idea. some witness said something about a van, and and some of the shoot from your hip pseudo profilers that get on TV were picked up on the van story. They uh, were not FBI. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I didn't realize that. So the well, let's go to Raider because that's our focus now. This is you describe this as helping Raider write a biography, an autobiography. It's yeah, an autobiography. A, yeah, yes. I, I call it a guided autobiography mm-hmm. because, unlike some of the serial killer narratives um, that journalists have coaxed out of of some of these offenders, this is structured with research and and clinical sophistication so that I would put questions to him or have him read certain things and have him re- reflect on those and respond to those things. So it wasn't really just wasn't him saying, and then, and then, and then, this is what happened to me. It was him thinking about how does this, how does this research apply to me. Mm-hmm. So I, even though it's his autobiography, I do in, interrupt it from time to time to provide a framework for readers to understand better. Well, you said that he was so afraid that the guards at the uh, at the prison would be uh, seeing what he was writing, so he developed a code, and then you had to decipher the code. That's how it started. Uh, I did have to decipher the code, so I have that as my my introduction to the book because it was such a strange experience to try to figure out why is he sending me these weird recipes and and magazine articles and stuff. I couldn't quite get. Mm-hmm. where I was supposed to go, and I knew it was kind of a test for me, because if I couldn't figure this out, I wasn't going to be able to do this. But it, it evolved, not, um, maybe within, over a couple of months, into me actually setting up the code mm-hmm. to use, uh, because, it, because his, he kept changing his, and I finally said, you know, let's just work with something. I, I created a code based on things I knew were meaningful to him, like the number three is big for him, so everything I put into my code had threes in it, and and then that's basically what we ended up doing is using the code that I made. Yeah, that bothered me that he liked threes because my house number has three in it twice. So, <laughs> you know, uh, that's a disturbing thing to recognize. <laughs> he wanted to change birthdays with me because mine added up to three. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. And. Actually, so does mine, so I'm, no. I'm like, doubly cursed here. <laughs> well, so that everyone will be able to uh, recognize this particular serial killer, tell us a little bit, bit about BTK. I know, I know a lot of people have heard the term, but they may not know uh, the person behind it. Yeah, well, what's distinct about uh, Dennis Rader is that he got away with it for 30 years and then emerged again. But he started in 1974 with the murder of a family of four, which is extremely unusual um, for any killer to start out with, with that many. And he, he then went on to kill um, six more single women, as well as an attempted murder on, one of, on the brother of one of them, and had in mind to, to kill one more bef- when he was caught. And essentially he um, was going after women to fulfill his sexual fantasies. At the same time, he was working as a security company consultant, so he'd go into homes and tell them what to do, how to set up their security. He was a a president of his church congregation. He was uh, married, had two kids. He completely passed as normal. Um, Nobody suspected what was going on in Wichita, Kansas at this time. And it was a decade where we, serial killers really started to become known. We had Ted Bundy, we had Son of Sam, we had the Candyman in Houston, you know, the, the trio. Right. Um, so, so serial killers were really beginning to hit the news, but Raider wasn't getting the attention that he thought he deserved. So he began to communicate with newspapers and TV stations, um, saying things like, how many do I have to kill until you put me among the elite serial killers? because that's what he wanted. And then he, after 1991, he stopped, but he didn't really stop. He just failed, let me put it that way, because he continued to have what he called projects, but he had less free time to pursue them um, because he wasn't on the road working. He had a different kind of job. So then he emerged in 2004 
and began to do what he calls his cat and mouse letter writing to the police. And he just got very excited about um, this this relationship he was developing with with the Wichita Police Department, and and then he made a mistake by asking if he could, instead of xeroxing his letters, which he he would xerox them four or five times on different xerox mm-hmm. copy machines to keep people from figuring out what machine he was using, and it was getting hard for him to do. So he asked if he could. Um, if they could trace him if he used a computer disk, and they said no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he was caught. <laughs> well, so that's, that's how we know who he was. Um, he was caught after 30 years. Well, he, is it true that at least this bit of the profile uh, is consistent with serial killers, that they think they're generally smarter than the police? Well, only the ones who are, <laughs> who are like predatory narcissists. We mm-hmm. do have psychotic serial killers who aren't. Mm-hmm thinking along those lines, right. but, but yeah, quite a few who have that narcissistic tendency do think that they, they can outsmart the police. I mean, I wouldn't say all serial killers are like that, because some right. don't have high IQs, right. but those who are playing that kind of game and, and looking for some kind of notoriety, they, would, they definitely think they're smarter. One thing that stuck out to me as I read about his first uh, killing of the four uh, well, actually, before that, just a kind of silly little notion uh, was the idea that here, here he was going to college and he was telling his wife, oh, I'm going to the library, you know, like the yeah. oldest cover story in the world yeah. for people, except that he was a serial killer uh, going yeah. to the library as his cover for killing. Well, but he's also a student. <laughs> I know, I know. He's just really. <laughs> and then he goes in and he tells these four people that he... Um, he doesn't think they're all there, but he, there's four people, and uh, mm-hmm. he tells them, as you describe it, that, uh, oh, I've, I'm in trouble with the police. I need to some food and car, and I'm going to need you to tie you up yeah. uh, so that I can make my getaway, but nothing's going to happen to you. And uh, that, that occurred to me at that moment that if you're ever in that situation, you've got to make your stand there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, your best shot is right now before they tie you up. But he, he already had done what we call mental rehearsal. He already had thought, he thought of himself as sort of a spy mm-hmm. when he was casing out houses and following people. So he already had kind of figured out what he would do in various different situations. He wasn't entirely prepared because he didn't know they had a dog. Yeah. He didn't know the father was home. He didn't realize they had three other kids mm-hmm. who were at school. Uh, he wasn't very prepared, but, but he had already rehearsed all kinds of scenarios in his head as to what he would do. Yeah, I remember him saying that after the first two or three um, projects, as he called Mm -hmm. them, that that was the the consistent thing for him was that uh, you never know what's going to happen, that you you can do all the reconnaissance you want, but life gets in the way. You know, people show up who shouldn't be there and dogs and noisy neighbors and all sorts of crazy things you can't control. One of the things that stuck out for me also was where he uh, realized that he had dropped his knife after that, (laughs) and he went back to get it. Well, that happened twice. He Mm. also dropped a, uh, he chipped his gun uh, getting into the final victim's house and had to go back and get the piece. Um, yeah, but, and he does go back. That, mm-hmm. That's the astonishing thing. Is he, he, and, that, and the first one was in the middle of the day. He could have easily been seen. Mm-hmm. Yes. In a very busy area. But it wasn't a secluded area at all. So what do you know about the mind of Dennis Rader that's different? Well, what was interesting about him, I mean, he likes to talk about having this factor X, which is what makes him a killer, as if it's a big mystery. And uh, that was my challenge, obviously, to see if I could decipher what was Factor X for him. And it certainly helps that I have studied many, many other serial killers, so I could see the trajectory in his life. And I I do think a number of threads come together. One was that he had studied other killers, specifically serial killers, as role models. And so that became a part of his fantasy life as as an adolescent. Two, he, he found he was binding himself and, and experiencing a lot of autoerotic fantasy just by, you know, choking himself and binding himself. So that became part of the thing he wanted to do to women, um, and, that, and he was really shy. So the fantasy was he could 
somehow capture them. But, uh, but then also he really wanted fame as an elite serial killer. So you have these threads coming together in, in his fantasy life to the point where he just feels like he needs to act on this. He sees an opportunity. And he, what happens with, with killers is after, after all the fantasy and they actually act out, they have a choice at that point to decide, is this, is this all it's cracked up to be, or, or maybe, maybe this isn't as good as my fantasy, and, and to stop. And that happens, too. But in, in the case where it is as good as a fantasy or better, you know, their, their brain begins to kick in that addictive substance, dopamine, and, and they want to do it again. They want to challenge themselves more, and they, or they didn't do it quite right. Now they want to get a situation where they're going to really be able to do their whole fantasy the way they want to. So for him, it was, um, yeah, this is all working, and, uh, and now he's going to build toward that fame he wants the fame, too. I noticed in one of the reviews on Amazon, I believe, someone made the point that uh, in the book he covers, uh, you know, binding and killing, but he doesn't cover torturing. Torture, yeah. And is that because he's hiding it to make himself a better person, or did he just not really do much of that? Well, he had, he had his fantasies were full of torture. He's He's drawn... His torture barn and torture silo, and you know, they're very detailed fantasies as to what he thinks. Like, he would tie people in his mind, tie them to the railroad tracks, and whatnot. But when he was actually in the presence of victims, although, of course, if you're if you know you're going to die, and he says that to you, there's, there's a certain amount of psychological torture, but he did not actually do the physical torture, um, except maybe one victim whom he also. Um, you know, he he did hurt her pretty bad. But, you know, extended torture, not so much. Well, the, interestingly, he seemed to uh, give himself a kind of self-congratulation for being kind to people. Like, yes. uh, like the guy oh, that had yes. a broken rib, and he said, well, I laid him down very carefully before I killed him because I didn't want him to suffer from that, you know, broken rib. Oh, you know where he got that from? In Cold Blood. Mm. That's, that's what... Um, Perry, I think it was Perry Smith had talked about giving Kent, the boy Kent a pillow while as they're preparing to kill him. <laughs> he looks uncomfortable, and also I think when they put Herbert Clutter on the floor, they put him on a a box so it wouldn't just be on the cold floor. I think I think Raider got that from In Cold Blood because he he really liked that movie and that book. And the woman that uh, one of his victims, he got her a glass of water in the middle of. <laughs> Of, yes. Of all of this. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Um, that that's that's part of what Raider's trying to get across is that he's a complex person who who has many kind and generous impulses. So why did he become a killer? As if there's no way he could really understand it or control it. But I think it's pretty clear from the portrait that's built that he definitely could have controlled it, and that's kind of a. Mm -hmm. In, ingenuous thing for him to be saying. Didn't he say to you that he was, uh, you know, a good person who did some bad things? Yes, several, many times. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what did the people in his church think when this broke? Well, some decided he was demon-possessed because they couldn't reconcile this person who had been helpful to them, who was the president of the congregation, who seemed like a very spiritual person who prayed with them. They couldn't reconcile that person with the person who was murdering these women in Wichita. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them, including the pastor of that church, had decided he, he must be possessed by a demon. Um, a lot of times people really don't understand how a person can live in this, what we call, compartmentalized way. Yeah. Uh, he calls it cubing. But in fact, anyone who daydreams can understand it, because um, you, you you can have an altered sense of yourself while you're driving. You can still daydream about something else, or or you can um, tell somebody you're you're a certain type of person, but in fact, that's not how you really feel. So there's a certain amount of ability to dissociate on anyone's part. He's taken it further into creating whole spheres of existence that don't meet, that are their own compartments. 
and that's why he calls it cubing, because each face of the cube is unaware of the other faces of the cube, but they're all, they're all part of the cube. Did you talk to his wife? No, it w- this book wasn't about anyone but him. Yes. I, well, I, the, the reason I asked that is because she came home one day and found him bound up in a, you know, in that uh, yeah. a special erotica that he liked to do for himself, and, uh, and she had a fit. Right. Well, she, that's his. That's his. Story. That's his description of it. And I know from others I've talked to that she says that is not true. Oh. Um, but I wouldn't know. I if it were me, uh-huh. and I I would say it's not true too. Oh. I mean, why why would I let anyone know that's what had happened? So I don't know that, or she maybe just doesn't remember it the way he remembers right. it. Right. Um, and so he can be exaggerating things, or he, or maybe he. he he was much more afraid of the consequences of it, mm-hmm. um, and so made it into something bigger. His, that's his version, and I have heard that she she disagrees. Disagrees, yeah. Yeah. But his version was also that she went to a therapist who told her that this is not that weird. Yes. Something like that, right? Right. And truly, autoerotic asphyxiation and uh, self-bondage isn't isn't that weird, but it certainly is weird in the context of a very conservative, Midwestern, yes. religious uh, point of view. So, yeah, it would be, and it would be shocking to see something like that. When was it that he first became troubled that uh, he wasn't getting credit for his brilliant work? It was shortly, when about eight months after the first set of murders, the family slaughter, he saw that the police were questioning three other, three men as potential suspects, and he wrote a letter, in part because he thought they were wasting his tax money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> oh, he does that. He does that, really. Uh, but also because he didn't, he didn't want anyone to get credit for what he was doing. So that started to bother him right away. And as a result... Um, when he then committed successive murders, for for a time he began to send some kind of communication or call it in, and and then he got upset that they just weren't paying attention to him as a notorious serial killer, like what he called Ted of the West Coast, which was at the time Ted Bundy, because this is still in the mid 70s, 1970s, and I think Bundy either had not yet been caught or was about to get caught or had just been caught when he when Rader was thinking, why, why am I not getting this kind of media attention? Um, because I'm doing this too, and yet nobody seems to be noticing. And so he was writing letters to, to um, newspapers and, and radio and TV stations to get them to, to make him more notorious. And he even named himself to prevent anyone from giving him a stupid name. Uh-huh. So he, he suggested three or four names that he liked and thought would sound good. <laughs> <laughs> is this uh, something other serial killers have done? Have others given themselves names, or is this highly uh, unusual? Zodiac. I mean, there are people who actually think Raider must have either read a lot about Zodiac or or is the Zodiac, which he, he isn't because he was in Japan at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are some who have w- wanted to stage the way police think of them because they want to control the narrative. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, a few have. It doesn't mean just because you name yourself that it'll stick, but this one did. Because he had a distinct signature that was very sexual, mm-hmm. and the, the signature itself made the name stick. Yeah, he told them at that time, as I recall in your book, he said that the next killing I do, I will make sure you know it's me. Yes. And that's almost like the Lindbergh thing, kidnapping. Mm-hmm. That's, what, that's what it sounded like to me. But that was also the kinds of communications that Z- the Zodiac killer in San Francisco was making. He was writing to newspapers. He was sending cryptic puzzles, just like BTK did. Um, and he was saying, you'll know it's me by my distinct signature, things like that. So these are, I know T- Dennis Rader has told me he he really wasn't that aware of the Zodiac Killer, but I actually think he had to have been. I think he's, because he copied so many other serial killers, why not that one? Uh, I think yeah. it's perhaps because it's, it's so much like Zodiac, and he doesn't want to be uh, unoriginal. 
<laughs> he wants his own branding. <laughs> <laughs> and he does definitely a, have that. He's very distinct in many ways. Well, as, uh, and you, as you study a serial killer like this who wants his fame, and I'm sure you've answered this question many times, it hits all of you who are serial killer specialists, are you not giving him that fame by writing books and doing interviews? Yeah, well, that's the question is, aren't you just giving him a platform? And I say, I am giving him a platform, but I'm doing much more. And the much more is that I'm also contributing to the field of criminology and forensic psychology and law enforcement, because I use his, his story to then add to our body of knowledge and hopefully um, some, some more careful investigative practices that is not to use stereotypes and not to be uh, guided by tunnel vision in these cases, because that's exactly what happened a few times in his case. So, yes, I'm giving him a platform, but A, the victim's families benefit from the proceeds, so that's one thing. Mm-hmm. But B, I'm doing more than just giving him a platform. Well, I, I think that um, it would be helpful to understand how that works. Like you said, the, that the families uh, get money from the proceeds. How does that, yeah. how does that happen? There's a, there's a family fund that an attorney uh, for the victim's families controls. And so when, whenever there are royalties from the book, my agent will send it to the family oh. trust. Well, that's very good to know. Yeah. That's very good to know. Yeah, I don't think I would have undertaken this without that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And I've met some of them um, as well and, and tried, you know, guiding them through what's, what's about to happen. Um, so, but yeah, I'm pleased that there will be that outcome. Well, I'll tell you the other good it does. And I read, I guess the other book on serial killers I've read, uh, it's an old one, Whoever Fights Monsters. Yeah, and, that's uh, a wrestler. So both of those books, yours and this one together, uh, make me uh, more conscious of uh, danger. That's you know? good. Because you know, I like a, uh, one example, I guess, is one I just gave you that uh, I realized his mo was to tell people, "I'm going to tie you up, but it's going to be okay." Yeah. And if anybody says that to me, I'm going to I'm going to fight now. Fight, fight, and don't let them take yeah. you to the second location. Yes. Definitely. And yeah. The, and then the other one. Um, one I read from Wrestler's book was a guy who, uh, I, I don't know, you may remember who this was, but it was a killer anyway. They asked him how he chose his victims, and he said they left the door open. Yeah, that was Richard Trenton. Is Chase. that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was reading that book one night at about two, <laughs> and I said, I'm going to get up and check that door, you know. I <laughs> well, I you know, know. The, the female students in my classes tell me I make them lock their doors, and I say, good, then I've done something, good, something yes. important. So why should people, we have um, a minute and 30 seconds. Okay. Why should people read this book? Well, I think they should read it in part to help the victims' families, but mm-hmm. also I think it is a different type of narrative of someone who became a violent individual in ways that weren't expected, mm-hmm. so, that you, so that you don't fall into stereotypes and that you are you are careful when you think there's something up with another person but he doesn't fit the stereotype you know that that may still well be a well-founded sense of something wrong and something that you should be watching well i think that this has been just a fascinating interview i wish we uh, had time in fact i'd like to talk to you about your other specialization vampirism (laughs) (laughs) but obviously we'll have to wait uh, you know for another day sure But uh, again, thank you for joining us today. It's a delight. Well, I don't want to say a delightful book, but (laughs) it's a fascinating book. And as I told you before, it kept me up all night for all the wrong reasons, but (laughs) absolutely riveting to read. Thank you. I appreciate it. So best of luck with the book. Okay. Bye. We've been talking with uh, Dr. Ramsland about her book, Confession of a Serial Killer, about the BTK killer, Dennis Rader. You'll like it if you like this genre. For Good Books Radio, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. Here's hoping that all your books are good reads.